So our next trainee is Danielle Tacolino. She's a white, able-bodied settler woman living, working, and learning on lands that are part of Treaty 13 and the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Covenant, Toronto, Ontario. She completed her PhD at the Institute of Health Policy Management and Evaluation at the University of Toronto under the supervision of Drs. Angela Colantonio and Christine Wickens, exploring the intersections of intimate partner violence, brain injury, and mental health as it relates to access to and use of and experiences with healthcare and community services. Danielle is now a postdoctoral CIHR-IHSPR Health Systems Impact Fellow at Women's College Hospital, where she works with Dr. Janice DeMont, the TransLink Canada Network, and Ms. Sheila McDonald, the Ontario Network of Sexual Assault and Domestic Violence Treatment Centers. Her postdoctoral research explores service access for transgender and gender diverse survivors of intimate partner violence and sexual assault. Danielle, please take it away. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And sorry about the acronym soup going on over there. It's a perpetual problem in health services research. We've got too many, too many words that all have to be acronymized. Um, all right, I'm going to start my slideshow and share my slide. Um, my slides, before I get started, I want to, oops, let's do this. Um, as I'm bringing them up, I just want to give a content war warning that I will be talking about intimate partner violence, uh, brain injury, and challenges with accessing healthcare in this presentation. I've done my best to take out anything uh, or to take out as much of what I think might be seriously triggering, but I do want you to take care um, and please step out or take breaks as you need to. All right, so I'm going to be doing a whirlwind run through of uh, the three parts that were my thesis um, today that is looking at the intersection of intimate partner violence, traumatic brain injury, and mental health. Um, I am in Canada, so we are looking at a Canadian healthcare context. Um, for those of you who are here, this is probably not a new inf intimate information, but I'll give a quick run through. Regardless, um, intimate partner violence is behavior from any form in of intimate partner current or former that um, causes physical, sexual, or psychological harm. Um, these are statistics in Canada. Um, about 44% of ever partnered women uh, over the age of 15 in Canada have experienced IPV in their lifetime. Um, and those stats uh, increase quite significantly for women who are living with disability, Indigenous women, and sexual minority women. And these uh, statistics mirror what's seen in the CDC, so it's not uh, Canada-specific, but it is... Um, uh, they're shockingly prevalent, <laughs> um, shocking prevalence. Uh, and about 23% um, of those experiencing IPV experience physical forms of IPV, which is where we get the risk of brain injury. So up to 92% of violent encounters uh, in intimate partner violence include hits to the head, face, and neck, including strangulation. Um, this, again, probably will not be new statistics for anybody uh, in the room which leads to between 19 and 75% of women survivors of uh, intimate partner violence having a likely brain injury. Brain injury is, uh, I'm using the umbrella of brain injury, including both traumatic brain injury and uh, anoxic brain injury. So both um, uh, alterations in brain function caused by an external force, as well as um, lack of blood flow and oxygen to the brain. And they're both uh, major causes of death and disability globally. So. The connection between brain injury and intimate partner violence, hopefully you being here um, and my very, very brief introduction um, has helped show you the, the link between those two things. Um, there's also this additional bubble of mental health um, that gets tied into both of these things. The, the connection between brain injury and mental health is quite well, um, quite well recognized in the literature, as well as the connection between mental health and intimate partner violence in the literature. This trifecta is where there is a little bit less um, less known. So my the objective of my thesis was to really understand what the implications of the co-occurrence of these three things was, um, particularly related to healthcare and healing. So I started with a scoping review um, that was guided by the question of what do we know? What is the current kind of base of information about brain injury and mental health among survivors of intimate partner violence uh, in the literature currently. These are results from 20, I think I ran the search in 2021, so they are outdated. There has been a whole bunch of new research that's happened since then, which is amazing to see. But at the time, we got uh, 755 results from the search, resulting in 28 articles being included. And we found a couple of kind of key pieces across, um, across that research. 
There was highly variable identification methods across intimate partner violence, brain injury, and mental health. Uh, different studies used widely different ways of determining whether somebody was likely to have experienced a brain injury, um, ways of them assessing for mental health concerns, um, as well as ways for identifying intimate partner violence. Some folks um, recruited from shelter organizations that were specific uh, specifically tailored to intimate partner violence. Um, others asked for self-report. Some of them used uh, spe uh, specific checklists. There were variable rates of mental health um, experiences around uh, among uh, IPV survivors, ranging from 25 to 100% of study samples across uh, the 28 uh, articles that were included. And in those studies where the comparison was possible, we saw uh, higher rates of um, mental health scores among survivors who had experienced a brain injury um, compared to those who had not. There was very minimal a, a investigation at the time into healthcare use. Um, there was a seminal paper by uh, Dr. Kate Iverson and her team uh, that showed that there was higher veterans affairs um, uh, health service use among veterans who had brain injury um, had experienced impotent partner violence and who also had mental con health concerns uh, compared to those who did not have mental health concerns. But that was really the only study at the time that looked um, that looked at healthcare use. And for those who are not familiar, um, the Canadian healthcare context is quite different than that in the, the United States. So we have uh, universal coverage for healthcare, um, or I suppose it's uh, provincially or territorial funded uh, coverage for healthcare. Um, it does va vary a little bit between province and territory, but um, but anything that's provided by a physician um, or provided in a hospital for the most part um, is covered uh, by our you know, kind of communal health insurance. So this led me to really want to dive into what those healthcare experiences were like, what are both survivors experiencing when they go to seek care um, and what are service providers encountering when they are trying to support survivors of, of IPV. Um, which led me to a qualitative study, which we had two objectives for. So the first was to explore those survivor experiences and then to explore um, the barriers and facilitators for service providers in um, providing appropriate care for survivors. So we did a qualitative research study uh, with 24 uh, uh, participants from across Canada. Um, we did predominantly individual interviews um, with a handful of focus groups transcribed uh, all of that data and then did reflexive thematic analysis using Braun and Clark's uh, six phases of thematic analysis. And I'm gonna go briefly through the findings um, broken up by the objectives. So when we're focusing on the experiences, the needs and experiences of survivors, we found three main themes. The first being that experiencing mental health and brain injury together was a whole ball of all togetherness. Um, the fact that the experience of um, extends beyond uh, the relationship itself, um, even after the relationship has ended, and that finding and getting access to care is uh, a full-time job. I'm going to talk about each of these specifically very quickly. <laughs> so firstly, um, they talked about the challenge of parsing out what was mental health, what was brain injury, what you know was a result of the trauma of, of um, experiencing IPV. Um, you know, survivors spoke spoke about things getting worse after experiencing IPV or about, you know, not experiencing things before experiencing things after and not really knowing whether um, the IPV was a catalyst or for something that might have happened anyway, or if it was a cause of something. Um, they also talked about, you know, conceptualizing an injured brain um, or injury to their brain as something that they really didn't think about um, as a potential impact. And, and that being aware of or having that brought into the conversation was um, quite enlightening for them and also empowering so that they could then, you know, take that and, and move forward with it. They spoke about um, the fact that these experiences you know, many of the survivors we spoke to were many years uh, post their violent um, their violent relationships, and they spoke about how the experience doesn't just end. The impact of that experience doesn't just end. Um, so they the trauma lasts. The experiences and the impacts of that brain injury, particularly if they haven't been able to get um, appropriate care or support, um, lasts, and that you know they're not going to go back to who they were before. 
Finally, they spoke about finding and getting access to care as a full-time job. I'm sure this will definitely resonate with folks in the States as well, because you need to actually financially get access to, to um, care. But here, even when they're in theory, isn't that financial barrier, getting access to things can be quite a challenge. So we had a survivor talk about the fact that she called, you know, she knew she was injured. She knew she needed support, called her family doctor who said, go to Emerge. Emerge said, no, this is a family doctor issue, round and round in circles. Um, and then everything ends up getting dismissed anyway. It's like, oh, well, we can't really do anything about that. That's not my, you know, I don't deal with brain injury. Um, and they really spoke about the need to both advocate for themselves as well as the power of collect, uh, connecting with other survivors and being able to support um, support others in their own advocacy journeys and advocate for others. When we flip to our second objective, looking at the barriers and facilitators experienced by service providers, um, this really goes into like how how is our system set up or not set up to provide care. Um, the service providers that we spoke to, and honestly, uh, some reflections through our, our survivors as well, spoke about the fact that identifying the three components was critical to getting appropriate care. Um, they talked about needing a, a flexible approach and a toolbox full of strategies when providing care, um, as well as the need to connect and collaborate across sectors. And then finally, um, probably not a surprise to anybody, the fact that underfunding and systemic barriers are, are huge hindrances to access to care. So there was a lot of talk about uh, among the frontline workers and uh, and management of, of frontline workers that they were, they had a specific set of skills and would bring, you know, their mental health related skills to a conversation without realizing that brain injury was a component and felt like they were spinning their wheels because they were throwing everything that they knew about mental health um, at the problem. And it wasn't, you know, it wasn't landing. And they talked about, you know, the challenge in Canada, at least we have, um, in order to get access to a lot of our medical system, um, brain injury supports, you need to have appropriate documentation of the brain injury itself, um, which is really not accessible in a lot of ways to, um, to survivors. They then went on to talk about the fact that, you know, given the fact that we need to recognize these three components, recognize that, you know, mental health could be playing a role but it also could be, there could be a brain injury component here, um, helped with having a flexible approach. And that by building out a toolbox full of strategies, you can try your mental health strategies when supporting survivors. And if that doesn't work, pivot a little and say, okay, well, I also know um, these supports that are useful in brain injury, why don't we try those? Um, and, you know, being able to kind of pivot and, and work with the individual to make sure that they are getting the support that they needed which is where connecting and collaborating across sectors also came in as a, as a kind of key finding, right? The, you would eventually run into an instance where you've run through the tools in your toolkit and the survivor in front of you is still needing, needing supports that you don't have. That's when it's important to recognize um, signs of various other aspects of what they're experiencing that you might be able to refer up to someone who's more appropriate um, to support them in with that specific thing. And then, you know, finally, there's the perpetual issue with underfunding um, in a publicly funded system, you end up with long, long wait lists. We also don't have everything fully covered. So mental health supports in a lot of instances are not covered. Um, and that can lead to very long wait lists or wait lists being closed because there's not, um, there's not enough support. Um, as well as, you know, problems with the way that our, our structures or our systems are set up, um, underfunded systems, um, racism in systems, ableism, sexism in systems um, that is hindering hindering folks access to care. We came up with a lot of recommendations uh, through this discussion that I won't go into because we're running out of time, um, but they're all outlined in, um, in the article at the publications uh, out of this work. So I'd welcome you to go and look at those. And then finally, I want to thank um, both my supervisors uh, who were integral in getting me through the PhD process, <laughs> as well as my committee members, um, and then all of the collaborators on this work. I had a wonderful team of, um, of folks who were incredibly supportive and, and uh, helped me scream literature reviews and, and code things. So uh, this work wouldn't have been possible without them, um, as well as the funding that I was very lucky to receive uh, and grateful to receive. 
And then, as I mentioned, all three, or maybe didn't mention, all three of the, uh, the studies included have been published and are available um, open access online. So given the short time frame, I encourage you to check them out uh, if you're interested in learning more. And I will stop there. Amazing. Thank you so much, Danielle, for such an impactful um, conversation that you've put together for us. That was incredible. I think we have time for about one question. Not sure that um, we have any, but I can ask you one. So uh, you had the table of recommendations and you mentioned a lot of this work was from your dissertation. Um, what I guess would be the most important recommendation or the most important lesson you learned from all of this work um, that you've sort of carried with you into the work that you're doing now? It's a wonderful question. Um, I think Honestly, this, the simplest one is that there are so many small changes that can be made to make spaces more accessible and more welcoming um, and less triggering for folks regardless, right? It's incredibly helpful for folks who've experienced intimate partner violence who might also be living with the impacts of a brain injury, but it's also important for neurodivergent folks and folks who have experienced other forms of trauma. I think we could be working um, we could make huge strides to making our healthcare system and our social care systems so much more accessible and welcoming if we made those small changes. Um, and they're really easy to do and not um, not particularly expensive either. So there's really no reason not to. Amazing. I know we have one question in the chat, but for the sake of time, I'm just going to hand it back over to Carrie for our next session. Um, but thank you so much again, Danielle and Jess, all of our trainees, a huge, huge virtual round of applause. We very much appreciate your time. Thank you so much.